right. Uh, my name is David Bowman. I have the pleasure of serving as the student body president for LSU Baton Rouge uh, Graduate School, High School, and Law School of this year. Hi, I'm Grace Milligan, and I serve as the student body vice president. All right. Um, so we're both going to be moderating this panel. Joining us today, we have Brianna Bourgeois, who is an LSU Health Sciences New Orleans MD and PhD candidate. Um, we have Abby Baines, Dr. Abby Baines, who is the vice chancellor at LSU Aid for Student Services. Uh, we have Destiny Harris, who is a student at LSU Alexandria. We have Dr. Kim Williams, who is an instructor of construction management and online programs coordinator. Um, then we have Grace Simone, or Simone um, instructor, instructor of mathematics at LSU E, liaison to LSU A. And then we have Dr. Clint Wilson here with us in person, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Um, so, Dr. Drothmeyer, you can just start off with like some opening comments or, you know, this open up for us. Sure, sure. Well, let me just begin by thanking all of you for making time to, uh, to chat today. I really do appreciate it, uh, those of you uh, joining remotely. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. I've been having a great visit so far. I had a great visit with student government uh, with Javen uh, just a minute ago and, uh, and, uh, and Abby Grace. It was really a, a wonderful discussion met with the, uh, the faculty uh, Senate and, and staff senates this morning. Uh, so just really appreciate you all uh, taking time out of your day. I know it's finals week and it's a busy time. Uh, actually at OU it's our last week of class so I've got somebody teaching my class for me and I'll be back for finals next week so I couldn't get out of that but uh, but anyway I, I'm happy to uh, to talk uh, about myself just a little bit if you want to hear that or we can just jump right into questions whatever Jaden how would you want to proceed I'll leave it up to you uh, if we you know, maximize the time for questions probably you think or yeah, well, yeah we can if you want to stop right into the questions okay sure let's do it yeah thank you <laughs> all right uh, we'll start off with um Brianna Bourgeois. I'm sorry for saying your name incorrectly. Brianna or Brianna? She's not. Okay. Oh, uh, well, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Baines. Good morning. Good to spend some time with you. Good morning. Uh, my question is, there are times in student affairs where the division of that part of the university can be looked at by some stakeholders as secondary to the primary mission maybe looked at as just the fun side of things, um, even by our faculty partners. So how do you respond to that perception and ensure that this critical area continues to be the integral part of a holistic education? No, great, that's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, we are here because of students. Uh, university wouldn't be a university without students, faculty and staff, but at the end of the day, you take students out of the equation, you don't have a university. Uh, I've been a professor for 36 years and uh, I stay in academia and I love academia because of the students of creative energy, uh, the, the talents they have, the ideas they bring forward. And so we are here to help, uh, help students in every way, help them grow intellectually, we're here to help them grow culturally, uh, help them grow in research and creative activity, whether it's fine arts and arts and humanities, whatever their, their uh, areas are. Certainly in student government, learning, growing their leadership skills, uh, student athletes the same way. So uh, student affairs, student services are, are critically important to all of those things. And to me, it's really the foundation of why we're here. And we need to make sure that we have the proper resources, the proper structures in place. Uh, we, uh, we understand, of course, some of the challenges students face today are quite different than even a few years ago. Uh, vastly different than when I was a student, but even, uh, you know, I've been in the classroom uh, for 36 years and, and worked with grad students and, and so on. Um, I find a lot of differences and a lot of interesting challenges. Uh, our students today are faced with, with unbelievable challenges, uh, more so than, than ever before. And so, as I said in, in previous meetings, you know, when, and I say this with uh, a little bit of, of twinkle in my eye, when, when parents drop their students off, their, their family members, their children, uh, to a university, they entrust them to our care. And that's an incredible responsibility on our part. It's, it's an amazing opportunity for us to to help uh, as part of the LSU family to help them grow. But at the end of the day, uh, we have precious cargo aboard this ship we call LSU, and we have to make certain that we are doing everything in our power to protect those students, to keep them safe, to help them grow, to challenge them, and to help them also learn to uh, make sure that they respect one another, that we, we debate with civility, with rigor, we debate intellectually, we work together to solve problems, and that we're all part of the big family. Student affairs is absolutely the center of the universe in my mind in those things. And uh, what would we do without student affairs? So whether it's counseling, whether it's guidance, whether it's uh, dealing with, with uh, challenges when a student doesn't show up to a class for a month and you're wondering what's going on with them, 
all of those services are extremely important and they're evolving with time. Uh, they're not static at all. Uh, the challenges keep changing and student affairs has to evolve to meet those challenges. So uh, I, I hope that, it, that I got to your question there, uh, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I heard that Brianna is on there now. Yes, apologies for issues before. Um, <laughs> my bad. Um, so my question for you is while research is conducted at multiple LSU campuses, it's often difficult to collaborate with students and faculty at a campus other than your own. How do you envision increasing collaborations within the LSU system that can benefit students? Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And let me say that there are many things that attract me to LSU, but one of the foremost is the fact that you have a, a very diverse system across all the institutions that are part of the LSU family. You have the, uh, the uh, laboratory school, a K-12 school right on the, uh, on the campus here in Baton Rouge. You have two-year, you have four-year, you have, you know, Alexandria, you have, uh, you, you have Eunice, you have um, uh, Shreveport. Then you have, you know, two medical campuses, you have the Ag Center, you have Pennington, you have all this array of, of amazing things, but yet it is not connected as it should be, nearly as much as it should be. In fact, you uh, at LSU could be the absolute national role model, I would say, for a, a seamless education framework all the way from, you know, from, pre from early childhood, pre-K, pre all the way through lifelong learning. And, and so this is something that really, really attracts me here. And I think that there's so much opportunity there. And frankly, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, that sometimes it's easier to collaborate with people in another state or another institution than it is people, you know, 30 miles down the road. And that simply can't be the case. And I think there's a lot of fear sometimes in, in that, well, if we, if we sort of, you know, work more closely together, we're going to lose our identity or we're going to lose our resources. One of the beauties of the LSU system is every campus has its own distinct identity, and you definitely don't want to mess that up. It's, it, you want to preserve that. That's so valuable, but it doesn't mean that working together, somebody's going to come and steal your resources. And that, that involves trust. It involves institutional culture. It involves also some sort of mechanical things about working together that need to be addressed. And so I've talked a lot with folks about this. And uh, in my own uh, university, uh, our Norman campus, the main campus, and then the Health Sciences Center campus, faculty that wanted to collaborate uh, with each other on grants had to believe, believe this or not, we're all part of the same university, had to do a subcontract. They couldn't just include them as a co-PI. It was ridiculous. And so we finally just got rid of that crazy thing. And there was some state laws that had to be, you know, that were involved with that. So ultimately, though, it's a culture, right? It's a culture of being part of the family where you're, you're, you're focused on the growth of your institution, but at the end of the day, you're focused on the growth of LSU broadly. You're focused on what it means for the citizens of the state, for the nation and the world. And seeing that in context, I think, will help people see, okay, I can still promote my campus. I can still do the things that I want to do. We can still grow LSU Shreveport. We can still grow LSU Eunice. But we don't have to, we don't have to be so protective that we, we are fearful of collaborating with the folks in our own institution. If it's easier to collaborate with somebody at another university, we're really doing something wrong. So that is one of the highest priority things for me is to come in and really help weave together that fabric in a way that truly is a role model for the nation. Including, I should say, including students. I include students in that all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Desi Harrison. Okay. Hi. So with the dynamic landscape of how school will be delivered, we have Zoom, we have hybrid, and we have in-person classes in the near future. What are two ideas do you plan to implement that will keep students involved and supported throughout these changes? I missed the last part. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. You said, what, what could you just repeat that last part there? What are two ideas you plan to implement that will keep students involved and supported through these changes? Oh, I see. Okay, gotcha. Well, I think I think the various learning modalities are really, uh, really terrific. Um, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. You know, fundamentally, though, we are creatures of, of interaction. We were created to do life together, to physically interact with one another. And I think uh, you can do a lot through remote learning and so on and so forth, teleworking and so on. But at the end of the day, I think that, that, that campus residential learning experience is so incredibly important. I actually have, I used to teach online back in the days of black and white TV where, where things didn't work. And I was teaching people at University of Puerto Rico at my I was teaching people at Mississippi State. We had a, a class that we were doing in weather and it was, it was absolute pain. 
Um, it's much better now, but still the challenges of interaction uh, remain. And I also have developed a, a completely online course uh, called Demystifying the Academic Research Enterprise. It helps students and, and early career scholars understand all the aspects of, of research. And it's, it's a completely online course. So there are a variety of, of, of things that I think we can do. And I know LSU online is, is quite successful. There are a number of degree programs online, many, many courses online, different campuses do that. I think the thing is, the, the, one of the beauties of online is it increases accessibility and it helps sort of, you know, kind of flatten the, uh, the landscape or, or, or you know, democratize learning to where folks who traditionally would not have access to these resources that have access to them. And the same is true for telehealth. So there's all kinds of things. But, but really to be effective in, in distance learning, it can't just be a videotape of somebody standing in front of a blackboard, right? There, there, are, there are ways to do instruction uh, by, by distance learning that are different than just simply in person in the classroom. And, and somebody once said that if, you know, if you've got like a big theater style classroom, if you're in the 10th row or beyond, you're actually doing distance learning, right? I mean, so, you know, so we have to really think about what it means to do that. So, so one thing I would say is taking to your question, the first thing is let's take stock of, of our digital learning environment, uh, really understanding are we doing it in, in the best way? And I, what I've seen is really fabulous. Uh, and really look at making sure that we are reaching populations that otherwise would not be reachable. Okay, that, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would do is to say, think about not only just in terms of degree programs, but also reskilling and upskilling uh, folks who maybe have degrees or credentials with a little bit of additional learning that can be done online, which will accommodate their schedules or whatever. You can take them to a whole socioeconomic level if you look at not just what degree do they have, but what skills do they have. This is especially important in rural communities and disadvantaged communities where you're, you're giving them additional skills. They don't necessarily need a degree. It might be a certificate or whatever. And those are very, very effectively delivered online. Is that a focus? I don't know personally. I, I haven't talked enough to the online folks to know, but I think it's a very, very powerful tool, but, but not to replace the residential in-person learning experience, but it's a, a very important supplement to it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, now we're from Dr. Kim Williams. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. So I actually was going to ask a question related to online learning because that's one of my areas of expertise, but you dove right into it. So <laughs> okay. the question that I'm going to ask you next is, what type of institutional policies as it relates to mental health and wellness do you propose to ensure that the LSU community is supported through environmental stressors like a global pandemic and social injustice? Mm, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Uh, it kind of goes back to the first question about, about student services, the totality of what we need to, uh, to help students. As you say, the stressors are very, very different today, the pandemic, my goodness, you know, are we harvesting the lessons learned from the pandemic to say, okay, let, we know we can do better. Uh, let's not just try to get through the pandemic. You know, going through that valley is tough, but when we get back to the mountaintop, we want to make sure that that valley experience is something that we really leverage and we learn from. So, so harvesting those experiences, making sure that, that we're adequately resourcing these areas. Because again, taking care of students is job one. They are why we're here. And, uh, and are, we, you know, are we working, for example, with the medical campuses? Are we fully leveraging the capabilities there that we have in our own system? Uh, to, to provide the, the mental support, mental health support and, and meeting the other needs of the students. Sometimes it might be necessary to, you know, engage uh, external interests apart from the, the LSU family. But I think uh, looking inside and seeing if we have the resources there that we can leverage, uh, very, very important counseling services and so on. Uh, I know there's a kind of a behavioral intervention uh, function here, uh, much like we have at my university where if you detect a problem with a student, a challenge that they're going through, you can get them help before it becomes a really full-blown crisis in their lives. And I, I've seen so many cases, uh, and this is actually to me some of the most fulfilling things that I've ever done as a professor, where you can, you can help a student not in the classroom so much, but you help them outside the classroom and that enables them to do all the other things that are important, including in the classroom. That fulfills me beyond what I could ever express. And unfortunately, there haven't been too many of those, but when they have come, it's just such an incredibly wonderful feeling to know that you help somebody through a rough spot in their life. Um, and I've, I've had a few of those, and my goodness, uh, they're, they're, but they're much more numerous these days. So mental health and well being are important. And I think we also have to make sure that people aren't stigmatized by that and that people realize these are serious, real issues. Okay, some people still dismiss that, oh, just tough it out or whatever. No, no, we have come a long way in society. We're not there yet to the end point. 
but uh, we need to make sure that people recognize these as bona fide challenges and take them seriously and that people are not stigmatized. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and next we'll hear from Greg Simonis. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so this is a two-part question. The LSUE at LSUA collaboration has been very successful in assisting students to complete one or more developmental courses and proceed to a four-year institution. The first part of the question is, do you support this program and foresee its continuation on the LSUA campus? And if so, what are some ways you can further integrate the two campuses to help the LSUE faculty and students on the Alexandra campus feel less isolated and more included? Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. And as you heard earlier, this is one of the things that is so beautiful about the LSU system. And frankly, these, these sort of uh, transition points between two year and four year, I think that's one of the toughest things that we deal with in, in America more broadly. And part of the reason is I think that uh, some, some universities that, that, that take students from a community college to your college, they find out they're not adequately prepared. And so it causes them to have a, a rather negative view of a two year, two year college because while well, these students that are coming in, they're matriculating, but they're not really well prepared. So we have to do a lot of remediation. Um, I think the first thing is uh, I absolutely support this. And I think, again, the uniqueness of either LSUA, or excuse me, LSU uh, E to LSUA or LSUA to uh, the, the A&M campus or whatever, whatever the transition points are, I think we, you know, again, uh, articulation agreements are great, but that's not the end of the story. Okay. The end of the story is working together in a holistic framework and supporting one another and not saying, you know, you're sending us students that are unprepared. I don't want to work with you. It's like, okay, that may be the case. How do we work together to fix that? How do we work together to address those issues? So yes, I absolutely support that. I think that that weaving together that, that sort of um, uh, connective tissue across the campus is, is to me one of the, the greatest opportunities there. So how do you actually integrate them? Well, there's sort of a couple of, couple of ways to think of that. I think one is, are there mechanistic kinds of things? Are there policies? Are there, are there you know, processes that need to change that are maybe have been around for a long time and they've outlived their useful purpose or whatever. But the other one is, is, is tougher and it's one of culture. And it's one of institutions trusting one another and saying, you know, we can, we can have our own institutional personalities. We can continue to be who we are. That's a beauty of the system. But working together doesn't mean that we have to forsake our personality as an institution or there are resources that somehow get, a bit, get taken away and given to some other part of the, uh, of the system. And that is a real big challenge and that fear factor is there and that that lack of trust, I think, is just human nature. And so I'm not in any way suggesting that 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 is is, you know, deeply part of the, the culture here, because I don't know, you know, I've got to, I've got to become more informed about the culture. But I can just tell you other systems that I'm aware of, uh, there aren't the unique structure that LSU has have those problems and I found in my life that universities are kind of the same everywhere, you know, so I'm assuming that some of those challenges exist here. But I think those are among the, the biggest opportunities for this system uh, to, to really help the transition of, of, of individuals across what are typically very difficult boundaries in our, in our education enterprise nationally. Thank you. Uh -huh. Awesome. Ready? Okay. Yes, so again, I'm Clint Wilson, professor yes. in civil environmental engineering. Right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit or ask you a question around a recent um, National Academy report, or I say recent, 2018, I think uh -huh. it is, called Branches of the Same Tree. And it was integrating arts oh, right. um, and into arts humanities in, with STEM fields, including right. medicine, right? And, you know, they, you know, points to you know, evidence associating, um, you know, positive learning outcomes, help students enter the workforce, live in rich lives, become active and form members of the modern democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think each of the campuses, you know, in the LSU system have, have an honors program of some type, right? And, mm -hmm. and an honors experience. And, and so I think, you know, you kind of argue those students, they, you know, that's kind of probably a lot of what they get, right? It's right. like critical thinking and, yep. and that. But, you know, as we think about, you know, the broader population of students, you know, whether you, you, we've been in the classroom a long time. Right, sure. And you realize you're not teaching, you, you know, you got to realize you, you're, you want to reach as many of the students as you can. So, you know, perhaps, you can speak a little bit about, you know, with you know, pressure for retention, pressure time to graduation, right? All these other, you know, in curricular issues, you know, how, how do you maybe see 
pulling those ideas or those into more of a general education or into the curriculum for the, the general student population. Right, right. No, that's a really great question. That is a, is a good report. You know, in, in the world of, of research, uh, in, in the sort of the physical and medical sciences, there's this term called convergence, right? The convergent research. Yeah. So this is really more the notion of convergence on the on the learning side, on the on the more, and not to say that research isn't learning, but more on the sort of the instructional side. Um, I think that the thing is, uh, a general education a curriculum is really trying to create um, students that are rounded in all aspects. So we're really training students and educating them not to just you know go out and get a job in a particular field. We are certainly doing that, but we're also educating them to be, you know, productive, responsible, civically engaged citizens uh, of, of the nation and the world, especially. So the, the skills they need to do that are, are very broad. And so whether it's, you know, it, it, you say there's STEM, but then there's also STEAM and bringing in these oh, yeah, other areas, great. right? And one of the things that I think uh, that we, we can do, um, and I don't know if it can become a requirement because everybody wants something to be a requirement, but I think certainly in encouraging students when they come into the institution, uh, and perhaps even in co-curricular activities while they're in high school, to really explore a lot of these other areas. Um, you know, okay, I want to be a physician, or I want to be, you know, a, a meteorologist or whatever. I'm going to take a course in art history and, and in world literature. Um, some of that may be required, but it's like really helping people understand that this is the last time in your life when, and although we're creating lifelong learners, and you can you can get a lot of that on your own, but to learn from a, a scholarly expert in those areas, now's the time to really avail yourself of that. And so this is, I think, where advising, where an institutional culture is, is such that you don't just come in and take all the, the sort of the core courses, but we want you to be well-rounded. So the general education curriculum sort of does that, but I think advising and encouraging students to be able to, uh, you know, to take some of these other courses to round out their views that are maybe completely different than what their chosen field of scholarship is, is going to be. Uh, and, and so how that actually plays out, I think whether it's a requirement or whatever, I think we ought to have a conversation about that. But I, I really strongly, strongly believe in that because I've seen the benefits of that play out in people's lives time and time and time again. And I think that report is spot on in terms of recommending that sort of thing. And we have so many silos in the academy, not the National Academy, but in, in the academia. And, uh, you know, it, it's sometimes difficult, like people say, well, you know, why are you taking that? It has no relevance to your course. It has relevance to my my, my, not necessarily my intellectual pursuits, but my humanity, you know, and, and sometimes people forget that. But a university is where all this wonderful stuff is there, so come in and soak it up. And, and so I'd love to have that conversation. I think it's really important and how we actually make that happen um, in, in the institution is critical. Okay, so I have the next question. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, there's been a great lack of leadership at LSU um, this past few years, and especially this past year when it comes to truly advocating for students' wants and needs. Um, so do you believe that you're going to be able to recognize what the needs and wants of students are above what maybe administration, the board, or LSU attorneys are pushing for? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the preceding uh, session that we had, uh, uh, Abby Grace, we kind of talked about a little bit of this for those of you who are uh, on, on the screen there. Um, I, um, I, I'm at a university because of the students, uh, first and foremost. I love students, I love working with them, and I am all about engaging students. And I gave an example, I'm happy to repeat it here in the previous session. We're at the White House. I created a committee uh, on, on the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology that involved undergraduate students, graduate students, uh, early career, uh, non non-academic professionals and postdocs. And this, this committee called the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology, PCAS, is, has always been uh, really eminent people in industry and, and academia and so on. They're, they're fabulous people. But it struck me as a professor that I, I said, you know, I get there, what's wrong with this picture? We don't have the folks who own the future at the table. Those folks do, the ones that are on PCAS, but, but we need the creative energy and the talent and the insights and the views of of the students, of, the, of the, the, the next generation who are up and coming, they've got to be at the table helping policy happen as it's happening, not just being the passive recipients of it. So my involvement with students has always been engaging them from day one. They're not the last mile, they're the first mile. They're why we're here. So understanding what students' issues are means hanging out with students, okay? And, and I can tell you that 
you know, people say, well, you know, if you're a president, you, you, you can't do that. Yes, you can. Okay. I mean, being at the White House, I had 16, 18 meetings a day, very, very long days. And I was able to hang out with a lot of people. I was going around the country, traveling, talking to people at universities, getting input, uh, having those conversations. Doing it at a, a university system is going to be easier than that, I would tell you. Uh, but it's no less important. So for me, it's not just important to make the students a priority. It's important for me personally to hang out with students, work with student government very closely and continuously so that I'm not always counting on somebody to tell me, tell me the problems, but I'm aware of them because I, I'm one of the same is true for faculty. I'm a professor first and foremost. If I become president, I'm still a professor. I work with the faculty because I want to live in their world because that's where I'm from. I want to live in the student world because I was a student. I'm no longer a student, so I've lost a lot of perspective of what it means to be a student. The only way I can make sure that I have that is to work with them. That's not to say I don't trust the provost and the student affairs folks. Absolutely, they're fabulous people. But there's nothing like hanging out with folks and building the trust relationship. You know, uh, we talked about this, Abby Grace, uh, in, the, in the previous session. There has to be a trust and a relationship developed so that when, when students bring things to you, they know that you're interested, that you are genuine, and that, you, that they can trust you to take it forward wherever it needs to go, or that you're actually out of heaven saying, hey guys, I see something happening. I want student government to be aware of this. So that, well, thank you for telling me that because from our perspective, we didn't see that coming. We've got to all work together. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but it's, it's tough to do, but it's part of the answer to the question that, that she asked of how do, we, how do we advocate, how do we make sure that we're we're uh, in touch with the student needs, the student challenges, the student issues. The answer is all the folks that work with the students, including me, not excluding the president, day in and day out. That's why we're here. And that's, that's very important to me. Okay. All right. Well, we'll circle back to you, uh, Dr. Bain. Great, thank you. I'm switching gears a little bit to, to funding. Higher ed funding has been in Louisiana um, and continues to be well below um, an adequate level to meet our needs for students. Um, our tuition and fees now makes up 70% um, of our total operating budget at most universities, 80% at LSUA. As universities have continued to place the burden of funding on the backs of our students, um, just to meet minimum operating levels, what is your approach to ensuring that our students receive quality education that they deserve without continuing to increase the cost to students? Right. Absolutely. Uh, the first and foremost question, right? I mean, they're really important imperatives. Title IX, huge imperative, diversity inclusion, huge imperative, budgets, salaries, retention, right at the top, right? Um, so, as you say, it's a challenge for everyone. And the cuts here have been, been extraordinary. And, you know, I think the more that you show you can do more with less, the less you get. And we're running out of less. We're running out of less. And what happens is people get disenfranchised, they burn out because their hearts are to serve, they're doing a great job. And they won't stop doing that, but at the end of the day, it's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable model. So. In the midst of all these cuts, I know there's been a lot of, of looking at measures to reduce costs, right? So the first thing you look at is, okay, are there maybe, you know, national purchasing programs that we can get involved with that will cut, cut costs here and there, cut, cut the E&G to where, you're, you know, you've got more money to invest in, in students and so on. Uh, you've got to have the institution be accessible. If, if the tuition and fees costs keep going up, you're driving students away. Uh, there are a lot of Pell Grant students, there are a lot of other students, you know, we, we absolutely cannot afford to do that. Afford meaning in terms of, of the state of Louisiana, the, the constituents that we serve the students. So what's the answer? Well, you can raise revenue, you can raise tuition and fees. Oh, that's not what you want to do. Um, one of the options here, and there are a lot of, a lot of things that one can explore, is uh, philanthropic giving. Um, philanthropy won't run the university. Okay, it, it simply won't. And, and the state support, as it continues to diminish, and you're putting it on the backs of fixed cost increases and so on, and you're not, probably not going to get it from appropriations. And you're certainly not going to get it from appropriations telling the same story you've already told. Um, so this is why I say we need a, a bold 25-year, quarter-century plan for the institution that is exciting, it's transformative, it engages the uh, alumni and the donors as part of the planning process. 
not where, hey, we've got a plan, come, come join us, will you fund this or will you fund that? It's got to be baked into the, their, their, their involvement has to be baked into the planning process from day one. And so there are some things you can do with philanthropic giving uh, to, in terms of things like funding scholarships and so on and so forth. The thing that I like to think about is, and I, I will not suggest we write off the state completely because you're, you're doing something that hasn't been done in a while and that's bringing a new president and that's an opportunity. Okay, it's an opportunity to say, we're, we're thinking of LSU differently now. We're, we're, we're holding on to that wonderful, extraordinary culture of LSU, but we're gonna go out there and we're gonna start to think differently and put out a bold plan that is so good, people simply can't refuse to support it. And you're not going to get anywhere if you keep saying the same thing all the time. And I'm not saying the institution has done that. It's done strategic planning, it's, it's done good fundraising, but I think to go to the next level, we've got to take a step in a different direction. So part of the answer to your question is, you know, private giving, working with the legislature, but I don't count on that, right? And, and you know, trying to keep tuition and fees to uh, a level that increases, in fact, the affordability uh, through scholarships and, and, and things like that. And using this, leveraging the system as much as possible to make sure that we are uh, eking out every value of every dollar that is invested. And I think that's, you know, I saw this at the, uh, at the Shreveport campus yesterday, the tremendous investments that the students have made, and it's going right back into the, the things that support them directly, and they see that. Um, but, uh, but those are some of the, the, the actions that I think can be taken. Um, uh, and I will give you an example. Um, the National Science Foundation has, uh, has had its budget increase in, in rather nominal ways over the, the many, many years, and it's done tremendous things. It's fun. 230 or more Nobel laureates and, and so on and so forth. But to really go to the next level, like some of the other, like the National Institutes of Health has done, we had to begin thinking of telling Congress a different story because just saying, hey, we need more money, wasn't gonna cut it. So um, that's exactly what's happening right now. And it's, and it's actually working. Uh, and it's, it's going to be good for America. It's gonna be good for research. It's gonna be good for students and student learning, educational outcomes. It's gonna have a tremendous impact um, but it's all about thinking bigger, um, challenging yourself to think bigger, and then presenting a bold, transformative plan in a way that is beneficial to people and connects to donors, connects to citizens on the street, connects to everybody. Faculty, everybody, when you say, what are we about at LSU? They'll say, here's what we're about. I'm not sure that that would be the case today. And that's true for a lot of universities, so not in any way saying bad things about LSU. But everybody has to understand what the institution is about and where it's going. Because if that alignment isn't there, then you're going somewhere and you, you don't know the destination, nobody knows, and everybody's moving in a different direction, what happens? It just sort of disperses. So I think there's huge, huge opportunity there. Um, and the other thing I would just say very quickly is um, the fact that this is a system provides more opportunities for addressing budget challenges than if it were a single institution. And I say that not in the sense of robbing Peter to pay Paul, but to say that diversity means there's more opportunities to get different types of assistance, different types of fundraising for different campuses, different parts of the system to where it's not just one thing that you're going after and that builds resilience into the system overall. And that is a very important thing when you're dealing with tough budgets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Brianna, if you have another question. <clears throat> Yes, um, so graduate and medical students often experience a power dynamic where faculty advisors or attending physicians can make it difficult to succeed if the student is not liked. How will you ensure that a student who experiences harassment can speak up and not feel that their academic career will be in jeopardy? Yes, indeed. thank you for that good question. And truly, I think that that exists uh, in other places as well. Uh, and this, this, this issue of a power dynamic is certainly at the core of what harassment is about or mistreatment of students or um, this, this sort of, you know, it's, it's a behavior. It's, it's actually a fundamentally uh, a behavioral characteristic. So I think there are ways, for example, in terms of what we talked about, you know, education, Title IX, those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, it's creating a culture where when individuals bring that sort of thing forward, it's not dismissed but it's, it's dealt with. But you wanna get on the front end of that and prevent it from happening to begin with. And that means that you are helping faculty learn how to be good mentors. The fact that th that kind of behavior is unacceptable and it's unacceptable from an institutional cultural point of view. And certainly if they're mentoring students in any sort of scholarly activity, that runs completely counter, completely counter 
to the fundamental tenets of what scholarship is about, which is respect, mutual respect, support, openness, collaboration, debate, that kind of thing. And it's just like plagiarizing a paper. If you're not exhibiting those kinds of behaviors, then you really can't be trusted, I think, as a scholar. And so when you're mentoring individuals, that is a, is a very, very high task. And if you don't have the respect for those you're mentoring, then you're not going to be, not only, not are you, not only are you not going to be successful, but you're really fundamentally running counter to what the fundamental tenets of scholarship are about. And so setting the high bar and holding people to it and holding them accountable through reporting and through mechanisms where people are not, and retaliation is a big deal, right? That's at the core of, of, of harassment. You have to have an environment where retaliation is not allowed and it is not accepted and that students have a mechanism to come forward. Now, I don't know if there's, you know, an ombudsman here, whatever, you know, mechanisms already exist for that. But, uh, but this is very, very important because that kind of strife will kill an institution. And we've, we've seen already some challenges that have happened that have taken a big hit on the reputation of, of the institution. We can come back very, very strong from that. And that's the beauty of of this kind of thing, it exposes vulnerabilities and you can't get better and get stronger unless you know what your weak points are. So this is the time to really address that, that important question you asked. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Destiny, do you have any more questions? Yes, I had one more. So with um, Alexandria being almost 100 miles away and Shreveport being even farther, um, just in general with all of the other uh, universities in the LSU system that are not flagship, how would we feel supported by you if you were named president? Yeah, great question. So I heard people use the term, you know, satellite campus <laughs> the other day. That needs to get out of the vocabulary, right? And they're, they're using it, just I get it, you know. But at the end of the day, each of these institutions is a fundamental integral part of the system. There are no unimportant parts, not a single unimportant part. You take one part and let me say it this way, if you take one part away and the system is just fine, then it's not a system, right? It's not a system. So in, in my case, our health sciences center is 20 miles north. It might as well be, you know, a thousand miles north. Sometimes like our research campus is a couple miles south. Sometimes the people like could be in another state. So distance is somewhat perceptive, right? But, but I think it really comes down to what we talked about earlier. It's Maintaining cultural identity and building trust for collaboration. And the only way you can do that is to make sure that people, at the end of the day, they see, okay, resources are not being constrained and they're not flowing in different ways because we're collaborating. In fact, they're growing. They're doing just the opposite of what one would be fearful of seeing happen. The only way you can convince people of that is to actually show it, you know, because we're, by, by nature, we're skeptical, right? And, and uh, you know, understandably so. So I think, you know, looking at how we can, and again, this is a really high priority for me, how we can look at the mechanistic things that stand in the way, the cultural things that stand in the way, to really truly becoming a single system that has very, very important component parts, but we don't lose their identity by working more effectively together. And there are things like the National Cancer Institute designation that we want to, we get it's a very, very important priority. You can't get that except for working together. So we need to have some, some good exemplars, and there are many out there, I think, already, but the stories aren't getting told, and I think that folks don't know about it. So we need to take those things, really learn from them, and maybe you know, then, then enculturate across the system these kinds of practices so we truly do operate as a connected whole. Thank you for the very good question. Thank you. Um, Dr. Williams, do you have any more questions? I do. So LSU graduates are highly recruited by organizations outside of our state. And while this is awesome, it's important for us to try to retain our top talent within the state of Louisiana. How can we encourage our students to stay home and develop a stronger workforce here? Oh, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great question. I think it really comes to the issue of the, the economy, right? The, the job availability here. Uh, are we providing a framework where um, students who graduate, for example, suppose they want to start a private company or private practice or, or, or create a studio if they're in the arts. Uh, are we providing the mechanisms as a state to do this? This is where the relationships, I think, with the, uh, with the legislature, with the governors, like, you know, you know, is LSU completely embedded in the conversation about where the state is going? And in fact, uh, 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 Wayne Brown is one of the, the board of supervisors. I had a great, a wonderful man. I had a wonderful chance to talk with him last night 
and he was this morning going to a meeting of the um, the hundred. I forget the name of the group of something one hundred. Basically, that the key players in the state, including uh, Governor Bell Edwards, uh, to talk about economic development. And so I think looking at the the issues of the state and possibility for economic diversification that could be driven in part by the fact that we are a land grant at LSU. We uh, have extension offices that do incredible things in agriculture, but the land grant of, of tomorrow is really taking that, that ag system and, and keeping it very strong and, and building it up and making it stronger, but also building out from it. It's not a, a you know, a, a sort of a fixed pie, but building out from it in rural and remote communities, building technology, building capabilities to advance the economy in ways different but supportive of uh, and in consonant with, with the agricultural uh, activities that have been traditionally very, very strong. So I think it's, it's you know, not waiting for the state to react, but being part of the driver of how the state can then react and create the culture and the environment that makes people want to stay in Louisiana versus going somewhere else. And really having the conversation, of, and I've, I've had this with people who came from, uh, from MIT to Oklahoma, and we use this guy all the time to say, why did you relocate in Oklahoma? And he tells this incredible story, and there's nothing like hearing it from somebody who made the decision to either to come here or to stay here. And those stories need to get told to the legislature, to the governor, because policies have to change, support has to change, it has to follow that. Uh, and I think LSU can be a, a very strong driver of that, but it's gotta have a very strong uh, support uh, and, and presence in the legislature and also at the federal level. So to me, federal and state governmental relations are very, very important. And I've, that's, I've been involved with a lot of that through my career, and I've seen the positive impact that that can, that can make. <clears throat> All right. Um, this is Simone. Do so you have anything else? I do. You touched on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in your previous interview. Uh -huh. What steps would you take to ensure there is training and resources available to faculty and employees on that matter? So one of the things I'd like to know is, you know, first of all, what are the resources that are, that are there now and are they viewed as adequate? Um, the second thing is, uh, I, I, I'm still learning about reporting lines because org charts sometimes are org charts, but they don't necessarily portray how things actually work. Um, and so my personal feeling is, and this is a conversation to have, it's not something I would come in and demand, but I think to me the diversity, equity, and inclusion activity has to really be at, in the president's office, and the president himself has to be focused on that as, a, as an institutional imperative. We talked in the previous session about the fact that our student body looks really quite good in terms of diversity. It still has ways to go, but the faculty ranks are, are quite not what they need to be. So how does that become an institutional priority? Well, it's certainly true for, uh, for uh, the provost. She's, she's, she's really amazing, uh, but also in research. I didn't find a single thing about research in the diversity roadmap. And, and there's, there's a huge amount of, of opportunity for diversity in research. And I'm not saying just studying diversity, but actually um, you know, building diversity through the research process, through external funding, through bringing people in in, in uh, COBRA grants and in, in EPSCOR grants and things like there's huge opportunities there that I don't think we're really uh, really seizing. So I would really want to understand what the fabric and the framework is here and then understand if it's under-resourced, kind of like the Title IX office was, was highly under-resourced. Uh, if it's not resourced to where it needs to be, that's, that's one key thing. But then the communication, the, the, the modeling, the cultural issues that have to attend that you know, resources are one thing, but, but actually driving the culture change is, is another one. That involves communication, consistent messaging, and involvement. This is, this is not just a, a president, provost, dean, whatever. It's everybody. It's faculty. It's students. Everybody is part of the diversity challenge and the diversity opportunity, I would say, as well. And so I would want to make sure that the entire institution understands where we're at, where we're going, and the importance of it, fundamentally the importance of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then lack, okay. That's fine. So and you may have, maybe this will be an opportunity to tie some things together, okay. perhaps, or it may not be, but I'll try it. Okay. Sure. Um, so, you know, and I think Kim could speak to this, or I think she, she has, you know, the increased growth in presence of LSU Online. And, right. And so successful. Right. And I think there's no question that's great. But I do think that that has kind of increased pressure on on-campus graduate programs. Right. In other words, um, you know, for research intensive faculty wanting to attract, you know, students who maybe 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago would have come to study with us to yep. say, I'll at least do a master's or I'll maybe right. do a PhD. Now they're like, I can go online. I can do this. Right. And so, 
you know, and I think this may tie in a little bit with, you know, thinking about them, you know, do, do, how do they see the value of coming to campus, right. actively doing research, you know, and thinking about really the a broader, you know, more inclusion into, you know, into bringing students to campus to see that and then the economic potential mm -hmm. of, and not necessarily to LSU, but to them and the right. state afterwards. Right, and right. Speak to that. Oh, no, that's, that's a great point. And I think it's, it's all about, you know, having a balance. I think there are some things like uh, uh, Georgia Tech did an online computer science degree, and it just exploded in popularity. There are, you know, I don't know, thousands of people have taken that and so on. They get done in something like 18 months. It costs $7,000, and they're out in the workforce. And that's, that's, that's really extraordinary. Uh, but those folks aren't going to do scholarly research. They're going to be doing, you know, all kinds of other things in, in industry. Not to say that they're not going to be creative or whatever, um, but uh, but it's a very fast track degree versus the more traditional uh, traditional degree programs we have here. So I think it's that we can, you know, you can't necessarily be all things to all people, but I think it's an opportunity to really rethink what it means to have a residential learning experience and say that the kinds of research that require you to be in the laboratory, to be in the dance studio, to be on, on stage, to be in the field, uh, those things are still extremely valuable and solving some of the toughest problems we have today requires that sort of thing. So I think, again, it's, it's the, the idea of, of stating who LSU is, what we're about at LSU, what are our priorities and what uniquely we could do, like the coast of the environment, you know, civil engineering, things like that, real interesting, challenging problems that really certainly are not amenable to online. So I think the worst thing we could do would be to to butt heads and have online try to compete. You know, it's more how can we be complementary to where when you add the two together, two plus two equals five, versus, hey, you know, we've got this, we've got this, but they're just they're all fighting for resources, whatever. I celebrate the online. I think it's it's absolutely yeah. wonderful. But you you can't not have it and it, it certainly there's no intention here to replace them, but you can't you can't sort of not talk about it. You have to you have to have these conversations and say, okay, are we really complementary? Are we making sure that this is, is helpful and not, you know, sending the wrong message to people and diminishing our research capabilities on campus? Yeah, yeah, totally agree. All right. Dr. Bang, do you have any more questions? Um, my only, I guess, last kind of follow-up would be, we know the enrollment cliff is coming. We have fewer students graduating. What are some ways that you see um, recruitment techniques and different populations of students um, being pursued over the next five to 10 years so that we maintain enrollment. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, and this, this COVID pandemic is created. It's just upended so many different things. Uh, but I think, I think that, and I mentioned this in one of the earlier sessions, uh, we don't know what our bench strength is uh, in this country. I don't think we probably know it in Louisiana. In terms of those individuals who really have aspiration or capabilities of, of coming into university, coming into two year, four year, whatever it is, we need to we need to find them. We need to we can understand where they're at. We need to go reach out to them. And frankly, a lot of times I think they just never realize that they have the capability or the opportunity because they come from economically disadvantaged areas, they come from all kinds of, of family situations or whatever. Um, we we assume that they're gonna find us. And I'm not saying we don't recruit them. Obviously there's a lot of recruitment that happens. But I think we have to go another step to you know, look at data, look at, look at capabilities as folks are developing and, and capture them earlier on to help make sure that they are successful and that they can grow into the ability, if they don't already have it, to come and be successful at the, at the collegiate level. So those kinds of things are important just simply because we want to make sure that everybody who wants to study, wants to have that opportunity and have their dreams fulfilled has the opportunity. And we can't just assume they're always going to find us. And, and I know, again, that's, that's not the assumption that's being made, but it's, it's one that we have to avoid uh, making just sort of by default. All right, we're going to the close. So if you would just like to do some closing remarks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I want to say a couple of things here about um, something that is, is out there uh, with regard to climate change, okay, if I could. Um, this is probably, this is being webcast, I believe, right? So I want to I want to clarify some, some misimpression. There's a I don't know what it is. It's a petition or whatever about about uh, me being a climate denier and stuff like that. I welcome that kind of comment. I really do because we in an institution like LSU, the university, we ought to be able to ask the question. We ought to be able to challenge people to say, set the record straight. You know, if, if I'm wrong, you know, 
help me understand what the reality is, what the truth is. So this is very important because I think people have to understand what the reality really is. So I want to give you some facts here um, because I always speak from facts. I welcome debate. But I don't like uninformed debate. I don't like emotional opinion. I like people to speak from what is really true. So, um, so again, the question is: Is he a climate denier? Does he deny the existence of climate change? So let me let me show you uh, some things. That part of the petition was that I could have, uh, I didn't do enough to uh, prevent us leaving the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, the president pulled out of the climate agreement in uh, June of 2017, which was 18 months before I went to the White House. So I think that speaks for itself. Um, I put in, as Vice President for Research, over a million dollars as VPR into the South Central Region Climate Science Center, we're now called the Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, and it involves Louisiana, it involves Mississippi, and that parlayed into $50 million of research for Louisiana, for Texas, for New Mexico, and for Oklahoma, and involved two Native American tribes. If I was a climate in our issue, we'd be putting a million dollars of research into that. Um, Vice News article, it was out there as an interview, it says, Drugmeyer said he does believe climate change is occurring and that humans play a significant role in it. The Washington Examiner quoted me, climate change is happening, there's no question about it. The question is, what are we doing about it? Washington Examiner. <clears throat> that same uh, article says, Drugmeyer in his former roles has criticized efforts by congressional Republicans to cut funding for climate research. This is in print in an article. Um, <clears throat> according to, this is another article, um, this is actually in the New York Times. According to several sources, this is why I was at the White House, Drogmeyer played a significant role in arguing against the creation of a White House panel in 2019 that would have uh, served as a major platform for climate denial. Absolutely true statement. Finally, Washington Post. It came as a surprise when a person was selected to lead the, the climate science assessment. It's a uh, quadrennial assessment in November because she is considered a mainstream climate scientist and does not question the seriousness of climate change like other scientists who were installed by the Trump administration to work on the issue. She accepts that human-induced climate change is happening, this is a quote now from Washington Post, and that, is, that it is a substantial physical, ecological, and economic threat. She was picked by Kelvin Drogemeyer, the director of OSTP. Although a Trump appointee, Drogemeyer was on the record as accepting climate change as real. I have a lot of other things that I can point to you, a report in 2007 before I went to the White House. Uh, I co-authored a report that the National Science Board put out. It's a very interest, uh, big interest to in Louisiana. In fact, uh, the governor supported this. Uh, it was about hurricane science and engineering, and it was about looking, partly looking at hurricanes under a changing climate, are they getting stronger or whatever. Um, and uh, I've also worked, uh, had a lot of conversations with uh, Chris Gilley here, the Dean of uh, Coastal Environment, about uh, opportunities for addressing sea level change, sea level rise along the coast. I think there's you know, huge funding opportunities and Chris is, is a terrific scientist. You have a National Academy member in that college and I'm very excited about what can happen with that college uh, in the area of, uh, of climate change and global change research. So I just want to make sure that folks knew that it's on the record in black and white <laughs> that those statements that I just read to you are quotes from the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Washington Examiner. I hope that put to rest, puts to rest any doubt about my position as a meteorologist on climate change. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to bring that forward. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And I appreciate all of you spending time with me today. Um, thank you for the great work that you're doing on behalf of the students of LSU. Um, you know, you're doing God's work, you really are. Um, these are precious commodities and they're the future of our country, the future of the world. And you all, I've seen nothing in here at LSU but passion, but undying support, service, giving of yourselves um, unselfishly. And it's, it's palpable. I can see it. I can feel it. And uh, it shows every, where I look here, everybody I talk to, not to say that there aren't issues. Um, there are issues, but together we can solve those issues. And I look forward to having the opportunity to do that with you. So thank you very much.